Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Episode 47. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you. A poem from Robert Frost. This is Birches by Robert Frost. When I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think some boy's been swinging them. But swinging doesn't bend them down to stay, as ice storms do. Often, you must have seen them loaded with ice a sunny, a sunny winter morning after a rain. They click upon themselves as the breeze rises and turn many-colored as the stir cracks and crazes their enamel. Soon, the sun's warmth makes them shed crystal shells, shattering and avalanching on the snow crust. Such heaps of broken glass to sweep away, you'd think the inner dome of heaven had fallen. They're dragged to the withered bracken by the load, and... They seem not to break, though, once they are bowed for so, so long. They never right themselves. You may see their trunks arching in the woods, years afterwards trailing their leaves on the ground, like girls on hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun. But I was going to say, when Truth broke in with all her matter of fact about the ice storm, I should prefer to have some boy bend them as he went out and in to fetch the cows. Some boy too far from town to learn baseball whose only play was what he found himself, summer or winter, and could play alone. One by one, he subdued his father's trees by riding them down over and over again until he took the stiffness out of them and not one but hung limp not one was left for him to conquer he learned all there was to learn about not launching out too soon and so not carrying the tree away clear to the ground he always kept his poise to the top branches climbing carefully with the same pains you use to fill a cup up to the brim and even above the brim. Then he flung outward, feet first with a swish, kicking his way down through the air to the ground. So was I once myself a swinger of birches. And so I dream of going back to be. It's when I'm weary of considerations in life it's too much like a pathless wood where your face burns and tickles with the cobwebs broken across it, and one eye is weeping from a twig's having lashed across it open. I'd like to get away from earth a while, and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go better. I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow-white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be good, both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.
This is The Runaway by Robert Frost. Once when the snow of the year was beginning to fall, we stopped by a mountain pasture to say, Who's Colt? A little Morgan had one forefoot on the wall, the other curled at his breast. He dipped his head and snorted at us, and then he had to bolt. We heard the miniature thunder where he fled, and we saw him, or thought we saw him, dim and gray, like a shadow against the curtain of falling flakes. I think the little fellow is afraid of the snow. He isn't winter broken. It isn't play with the little fellow at all. He's running away. I doubt if even his mother could tell him, sakes, it's only weather. He'd think she didn't know. Where is his mother? He can't be out alone. And now he comes again with a clatter of stone and mounts the wall again with whited eyes and all his tail that isn't hair up straight. He shudders his coat as if to float, throw off flies. Whoever it is that leaves him out so late when other creatures have gone to stall and bin ought to be told to come and take him in. This poem is called To Look at Two by Robert Frost. Love and forgetting might have carried them a little further up to the mountainside with night so near, but not much further up. They must have halted soon, in any case, with thoughts of a path back. How rough it was. With rock and washout and unsafe in darkness, when they were halted by a tumbled wall with barbed wire binding, they stood facing this, spending what onward impulse they still had, and one last look, the way they must not go on up the failing path, where if a stone or earth slide moved at night, it moved itself. No footstep moved it. This is all, they sighed. Good night to woods. But not so. There was more. A doe from round a spruce stood looking at them across the wall, as near the wall as they. She saw them in their field, they, her, in hers. The difficulty of seeing what stood still like some upended boulder split in two was in her clouded eyes. They saw no fear there. She seemed to think that two thus they were safe. Then, as if they were something that, though strange, she could not trouble her mind with too long, she sighed and passed unscarred along the wall. This, then, is all. What more is there to ask? But no, not yet. A snort to bid them wait. A buck from round the spruce stood looking at them across the wall as near the wall as they. This was an antlered buck of lusty nostril, not the same doe come back to into her place. He viewed them quizzically with jerks of the head as if to ask, why don't you make some motion or give some sign of life? Because you can't. I doubt if you are as living as you look. Thus, till he had them almost feeling dared to stretch a proffering hand and a spell breaking. Then he too passed unscarred along the wall. Two had seen two. Whichever side you spoke from, this must be all. It was all. Still they stood, a great wave from it going over them as if the earth, in one unlooked-for favor, had made them certain earth returned their love. Whew. Yeah, that's good. 
This is called Come In by Robert Frost. As I came to the edge of the woods, thrush music, hark. Now, if it was dusk outside, inside, it was dark. Too dark in the woods for a bird by sleight of wing to better its perch for the night, though it could still sing. The last of the light of the sun that had died in the west still lived for one song more in a thrush's breast. Far in the pilloried dark, thrush music went, almost like a call to come into the dark and lament. But no, I was out for stars. I would not come in. I meant not even if asked. And I hadn't been. Published in 1904, this story is called The Cop and the Anthem by O. Henry. (sighs) On his bench in Madison Square, Soapy moved uneasily. When wild geese honk high of nights, and when women without sealskin coats grow kind to their husbands, and when Soapy moves uneasily on his bench in the park, you may know that winter is near at hand. A dead leaf fell in Soapy's lap. That was Jack Frost's card. Jack is kind to the regular denizens of Madison Square and gives fair warning of his annual call. At the corners of four streets, he hands his pasteboard to the north wind, footmen to the mansion of all outdoors so that the inhabitants thereof may make ready. Soapy's mind became cognizant of the fact that the time had come for him to resolve himself into a singular committee of ways and means to provide against the coming harshness of weather, and therefore, he moved uneasily on his bench. The hibernatorial ambitions of Soapy were not of the highest. In them, there were no considerations of Mediterranean cruises of sleep-inducing southern skies drifting in the Vesuvian Bay. Three months on the island, Black Whales Island, this is the local jail, was what his soul craved. Three months of assured board and bed and congenial company, safe from Boreas and Bluecoats, seemed to Soapy the essence of things desirable. By the way, in Greek mythology, Boreas are the personification of the North Wind. For years, the hospitable Blackwells had been his winter quarters. Just as his more fortunate fellow New Yorkers had bought their tickets to Palm Beach and the Riviera each winter, so Soapy had made his humble arrangements for his annual migration to the island. And now, the time was come. On the previous night, three Sabbath newspapers, Sunday papers, distributed beneath his coat, about his ankles, and over his lap had failed to repulse the cold as he slept on his bench near the spurting fountain in the ancient square. So, the island loomed big and timely in Soapy's mind. He scorned the provisions made in the name of charity for the city's dependents. In Soapy's opinion, the law was more benign than philanthropy. There was an endless round of institutions on which he might set out and receive lodging and food accordant with a simple life. But to one of Soapy's proud spirit, the gifts of charity are encumbered. If not in coin, you must pay in humiliation of spirit for every benefit received at the hands of philanthropy. As Caesar had his Brutus 
Every bed of charity must have its toll of a bath, every loaf of bread its compensation of a private and personal inquisition. Wherefore, it is better to be the guest of the law, which, though conducted by rules, does not meddle unduly with a gentleman's private affairs. Soapy, having decided to go to the island, at once set about accomplishing his desire. There were many easy ways of doing this. The pleasantest was to dine luxuriously at some expensive restaurant, and then, after declaring insolvency, be handed over quietly and without uproar to a policeman. An accommodating magistrate would do the rest. Sophie, Soapy left his bench and strolled out of the square and across the level sea of asphalt where Broadway and Fifth Avenue flow together. Up Broadway, he turned and halted at a glittering cafe where are gathered together nightly the choicest products of the grape, the silkworm, and the protoplasm. To unpack that, the choicest products of the grape would be wine, of the silkworm would be presumably silk tablecloths, and the protoplasm, oh, the animal and plant life that make up wonderful divine food. Soapy had confidence in himself from the lowest button of his vest upward. He was shaven, and his coat was decent, and his neat black, ready-tied four in hand had been presented to him by a lady missionary on Thanksgiving Day. This is kind of the equivalent of a clip-on tie, if you want to follow that. If he could reach a table in the restaurant, unsuspected success would be his. The portion of him that would show above the table would raise no doubt in the waiter's mind. A roasted mallard duck, thought Soapy, would be the thing. With a bottle of Chablis and then Camembert. A Demitas and a cigar. One dollar for the cigar would be enough. The total would not be so high as to call forth any supreme manifestation of revenge from the cafe management, and yet the meat would leave him filled and happy for the journey to his winter refuge. But as Soapy set foot inside the restaurant door, the head waiter's eye fell upon his frayed trousers and his decadent shoes. Strong and ready hands turned him about and conveyed him in silence and haste to the sidewalk and averted the ignoble fate of the mallard. <sighs> Soapy turned off Broadway. It seemed that his route to the coveted island was not to be an Epicurean one. Some other way of entering limbo must be thought of. Another funny sidebar. I always thought Epicurus, who was a Greek philosopher, he lived around 300 BC, wasn't like some culinary great. He wasn't like a chef or anything that you would call that. Epicurus just pointed out that in the worst times of the most impoverished of the Greeks that he knew, they would put out their best foods at, on altars as sacrifice to the gods. And Epicurus's simple position on this ritual was, maybe during times of drought and starvation, we should keep our best food and drink for ourselves and not just let them rot upon altars. Somehow, to this day, we have Epicurean items in our kitchen, I mean, Epicurean, not just by description, but actual brand name for like modern day food processors. I think it would have really surprised him the same way that it would surprise Jesus to inspire violence in his followers that Epicurus 
inspires some sort of foodie repu- reputation amongst uh, amongst his peers. But in any case, at a at a corner of Sixth Avenue, electric lights and cunningly displayed wares behind plate glass made a shop window conspicuous. Soapy took a cobblestone and dashed it through the glass. People came running around the corner, a policeman in the lead. Soapy stood still with his hands in his pockets and smiled at the sight of brass buttons. Hey, uh, where the man, where the man that done that? inquired the officer excitedly. Don't you figure out that I might have had something to do with it? said Soapy. Not without sarcasm, but friendly, as one greets good fortune. The policeman's mind refused to accept Soapy even as a clue. Men who smash windows do not remain to parlay with the law's minions. They take to their heels. The policeman saw a man halfway down the block running to catch a car. With a drawn club, he joined in the pursuit. Soapy, with disgust in his heart, loafed along, twice unsuccessful. On the opposite side of the street was a restaurant of no great pretensions. It catered to large appetites and modest purses. Its crockery and atmosphere were thick. Its soup and napery, thin. Napery, by the way, would be like linens, like tablecloths and napkins. So, it's a good... Uh, second alternative to the fancy cafe that he had per- picked out first. Into this place, Soapy took his accusative shoes and telltale trousers without challenge. At a table, he sat and consumed beefsteak, flapjacks, donuts, and pie. And then, to the waiter, betrayed the fact that the minutest coin and himself were strangers. Now, Get busy and call a cop, said Soapy, and don't keep a gentleman waiting. Hey, uh, no cop for use, said the waiter with a voice like butter. Hey, con! Neatly upon his left ear on the callous pavement, two waiters pitched Soapy. He arose joint by joint as a carpenter's ruler opens and beat the dust from his clothes. Arrest seemed but a rosy dream. The island seemed very far away. A policeman who stood before a drugstore two doors away laughed and walked down the street. Five blocks, Soapy traveled before his courage permitted him to woo capture again. This time, the opportunity presented what he fatuously turned himself a cinch. A young woman of a modest and pleasing guise was standing before a show window, gazing with sprightly interest at its display of shaving mugs and inkstands, and two yards from the window, a large policeman of severe demeanor leaned against a water plug. It was Soapy's design to assume the role of despicable and execrated masher. The refined and elegant appearance of his victim and the um, contiguity of the conscientious cop encouraged him to believe that he would soon feel the pleasant official clutch upon his arm that would ensure his winter quarters on the right little, tight little aisle. Soapy straightened the ready-made tie dragged his shrinking cuffs into the open, set his hat, and sidled toward the young woman. He made eyes at her, was taken with sudden coughs and hymns, smiled, smirked, and went brazenly through the impudent and contemptible litany of the masher. With half an eye, Soapy saw that the policeman was watching him fixedly. The young woman moved away a few steps and again bestowed her absorbed attention upon the shaving mugs. Soapy followed, boldly stepping to her side, raising his hat, and said, Ah, there, Bedelia. 
Don't you want to come and play in my yard? The policeman was still looking. The persecuted young woman had but to beckon a finger, and Soapy would be practically en route for his insular haven. Already, he imagined he could feel the cozy warmth of the station house. The young woman faced him and, stretching out a hand, caught Soapy's coat sleeve. Sure, Mike, she said joyfully, if you buy me a pail of suds. I'd have spoke to you sooner, but the cop over there was watching. With the young woman playing clinging ivy to his oak, Soapy walked past the policeman, overcome with gloom. He seemed doomed to liberty. At the next corner, he shook off his companion and ran. He halted in the district where by night are found the lightest streets, hearts, vows, and librettos. Women in fur and men in greatcoats moved gaily in the wintry air. A sudden fear seized Soapy that some dreadful enchantment had rendered him immune to arrest. The thought brought a little of panic upon it, and when he came upon another policeman lounging grandly in front of a transplendent theater, he caught at the immediate straw of disorderly conduct. On the sidewalk, Soapy began to yell drunken gibberish at the top of his harsh voice. He danced, he howled, he raved, and otherwise just disturbed the welkin. The policeman twirled his club, turned his back to Soapy, and remarked to a citizen, Ah, yeah, tis one of them Yale lads celebrating the goose egg they gave to the Hartford College. Noisy, but no harm. We have instructions to leave him be. Disconsolate. Soapy ceased his unavailing racket. Would a policeman never lay hands upon him? In his fancy, the island seemed an unattainable Arcadia. By the way, for the Southern Californians listening, Arcadia in this context is not just this kind of nice place near Pasadena. Arcadia is... Uh, a term used to describe the um, pastoral aesthetic perfection of a little area of Greece that probably looks like heaven on earth. So, Soapy buttoned his thin coat against the chilling wind. In a cigar store, he saw a well-dressed man lighting a cigar at a lighting, at a swinging light. His silk umbrella he had set by the door on entering. Soapy stepped inside, secured the umbrella, and sauntered off with it slowly. The man at the cigar light followed hastily. Um, my umbrella, he said sternly. Oh, is it? Sneered Soapy, adding insult to petty larcenary. So, why don't you call a policeman? I took it. Your umbrella. Why don't you call a cop? There stands one on the corner. The umbrella owner slowed his steps. Soapy did likewise. With a presentiment that luck would again run against him, the policeman looked at the two of them curiously. Oh, uh, of course, said the umbrella man. That is, well, I, you know how these mistakes occur. I, look, if it's your umbrella, I, I hope you'll excuse me. I, I picked it up this morning in a restaurant. If you recognize it as yours, why, I, I hope you'll... Of course it's mine, said Soapy. Viciously, the ex-umbrella man retreated. The policeman hurried to assist a tall blonde in an opera cloak across the street in front of a streetcar that was approaching two blocks away. 
Soapy walked eastward through a street damaged by improvements. He hurled the umbrella wrathfully into an excavation. He muttered against the men who wear helmets and carry clubs. But... He wanted to fall into their clutches. They seemed to regard him as a king who could do no wrong. At length, Soapy reached one of the avenues to the east where the glitter and turmoil was but faint. He set his face down this street toward Madison Square, for the homing instinct survives even when the home is a park bench. But on an, on an unusually quiet corner, Soapy came to a standstill. Here was an old church, quaint and rambling and gabled. Through one violet-stained window, a soft light glowed, where, no doubt, the organist loitered over the keys, making sure of his mastery of the coming, coming Sabbath anthem. For there drifted out to Soapy's ears sweet music that caught and held him transfixed against the convolutions of the iron fence. The moon was above, lustrous, serene. Vehicles and pedestrians were few. Sparrows twittered sleepily in the eaves. For a little while, the scene might have been a country churchyard, and the anthem that the organist played cemented Soapy to the iron fence, for he had known it well in the days when his life contained such things as mothers and roses and ambitions and friends and immaculate thoughts and collars. The conjunction of Soapy's receptive state of mind and the influences about the old church wrought a sudden and wonderful change in his soul. He viewed with swift horror the pit into which he had tumbled, the degraded days, unworthy desires, dead hopes, wrecked faculties, and base motives that made up his existence. And also, in a moment, his heart responded thrillingly to this novel mood. An instantaneous and strong impulse moved him to battle with his desperate fate. He would pull himself out of the mire. He would make a man of himself again. He would conquer the evil that had taken possession of him. There was time. He was comparatively young yet. He would resurrect his old, eager ambitions and pursue them without faltering. Those solemn but sweet organ notes had set up a revolution in him. Tomorrow, he would go into the roaring downtown district, and he would find work. A fur importer had once offered him a place as driver. He would find him tomorrow and ask for the position. He would be somebody in the world. He would... Soapy felt a hand laid on his arm. He looked quickly around into the broad face of a policeman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are you doing here? Asked the officer. Nothing, said Soapy. All right, then. Come along, said the policeman. Three months on the island said the magistrate in the police court the next morning. Yeah, so... So what happened there? Why is it called the cop and the anthem? Why is this relevant? So, they used the... Oh, Henry, not they use the word anthem twice, as I counted in reading. 
uh, once was specifically the Sunday anthem. It's it's just beautiful, transcendent church organ music. And it was so incredible that as he looked at the moon, he decided he was going to turn his life around for the better. And that was the point that he got busted, presumably for loitering, right at the point where he decided jail is not the option. That's when, ironically, he gets grabbed and and prosecuted. So, the cup and the anthem were the things that unwittingly turned his life around toward the unfortunate that he was wishing for for 92% of the story. If the story sounds familiar, there have been several adaptations of this. The, The story was adapted as a segment in the 1952 anthology film O. Henry's Full House, and uh, that starred uh, Charles Layton, Marilyn Monroe, and uh, David Wayne, not Damon Wayne. Um, The cop in the anthem also inspired an episode of the Red Skelton Show on December 21st, 1954, with Red Skelton's character Freddy the Freeloader as the protagonist. Uh, Skelton also did another enactment of this story for his holiday program of December 23rd, 1958. And, okay, here's uh, for for classic animation fans out there, the um, 1978 animated special, The Pink Panther in A Pink Christmas, also borrows part of its plot from the story and combines it with Awesome music. (laughs) Love that about the Pink Panther. Indeed. We launch into Ask Hunter Anything. Ask Hunter Anything. Email address askhunteranything at gmail.com. It's great just specifically to submit questions. Um, I keep talking about this uh, space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. It is going up uh, later this later this month in December. Finally, it's finally going up. Um, this thing, as I alluded to once earlier this evening is going to change humanity's view of the universe. So, the previous space telescope, it's still up there, the Hubble. The Hubble did this this really neat thing, um, I don't know, a couple of decades ago. Like, one of the coolest images that we got from the, the Hubble was one of the coolest images because the expectations were so low And the payoff was so high. There was this thing in the Hubble's history called the deep field experiment. So basically, they they focused the Hubble at the darkest part of the night sky where just nothing was visible. I mean, it was just blackness. And they kept the aperture open for a long period of time so that it could gather a lot of light from this darkest part of the sky. And in this darkest part of the sky, when they looked at the images that had been gathered, they found hundreds upon hundreds of galaxies that were just so far away and so faint, no human had ever seen them before. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be something like two and a half times as sensitive as the Hubble. And where the Hubble, the Hubble is geared largely toward visible light. This is visible light definable by human eyes. 
The James Webb Space Telescope is going is already geared much more toward infrared. So of the many advantages infrared has over human visible light, one of these things is that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to see through clouds of dust that the Hubble would not have been able to penetrate. Because remember we were talking about Rayleigh scattering last week, uh, last week we were um, answering the question of why is the sky blue? Part of that answer was why are sunsets red? So if you recall, the punchline to why are sunsets and sunrises red is because the red wavelengths of light coming from the sun were sort of like the Mack truck of the light wavelength that could just punch through all of the atmosphere that is scattering all of the smaller wavelengths of light. That is exactly what James Webb Telescope is geared to see. It's not only geared to see reds, but it's geared to see redder than human eyes can see. We call that the infrared. This translates to a description that you could describe as heat. So, this thing is going to be able to see the Mack truck of long wavelengths, long red wavelengths that just punch through dust that the Hubble would not have been able to see. This thing is similarly, the, the way I just described Hubble as the, the deep field experiment, the way that Hubble saw tons of galaxies in this little tiny previously thought to be totally black patch of sky. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to see the earliest galaxies formed way back at the actual dawn of time. This is very important, <laughs> to say the least. <clears throat> Somebody kind of casually asked me, this was not a uh, question that was submitted to ask Hunter anything. Um, this was asked just kind of briefly in um, private conversation. Um, the person asked, so where is this thing going? Why, is it going somewhere near the Hubble? Is it just another space telescope? What are the differences between the two? Okay, so to answer that question, the Hubble Space Telescope um, has always been in a low Earth orbit. So the, uh, the Hubble is going around the Earth, right? The James Webb Space Telescope is going to have its own orbit around the sun. So it is going in what we call the Earth-Sun Lagrange 2 point. Now, all that means is that there is a gravitationally stable place on the other side of the, the Earth where the Sun, the Earth, and the James Webb Space Telescope are going to make a more or less a straight line. And that is what we call the L2 Lagrange point. And it's about, it's just, just short of a million miles away from the Earth. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope we put up in the early 90s, and there were some things that were off about the construction and the engineering of it. So we had to send up a shuttle team of astronauts to fix it. Um, we had to send up some astronauts who uh, could go in and put corrective gear on the Hubble Space Telescope that uh, the corrective gear basically served like eyeglasses and corrected the blurriness of the of the Hubble. 
You know that that thing you get with uh, fish eye lenses, like GoPros, or go. Sometimes like the old GoPros are kind of like screwed up and distorted, like in the center and then the edges. You know, you got this fish eye lens. That's kind of what the Hubble had in an extreme, and so astronauts were able to put corrective gear into the Hubble and um, and, and and fix the images coming in. The James Webb Space Telescope, because it's not going into a low Earth orbit, because it's going so much further away from the Earth than we have ever put humans into space, we got to get this right on the first time. This thing is not going to be fixable, at least not with current technology, if it does not deploy properly. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be so sensitive in the infrared that it is going to be able to look into space and see galaxies whose light took almost the entire age of the universe to get to where the James Webb Space Telescope is currently. So the galaxy, so uh, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. This thing is going to be able to see galaxies that are about 13.7 billion years old. That is literally the oldest galaxies in existence. So these are galaxies that upon their formation took off in an opposite direction from our own galaxy or from our own current location and took off about as fast as they could possibly go. However, they were still shining light in every direction and the light that is heading back toward us, so this light is moving opposite the direction that that galaxy is traveling, that light is going to be something like 13.7 billion years old by the time it goes into the James Webb Space Telescope. And so, yeah, it's, it's very much like the hypothetical of if the sun were to suddenly instantaneously explode, we wouldn't know until about eight, month, eight minutes later. Um, well, it's not that, the, that that light is so slow... <laughs> It's that it's that that light came from so far away, and it is also that that uh, that the space in between where that light originated and where we're observing has expanded so much, because yeah, light is always going to go the same speed. We literally call it the speed of light. Is it like when we see stars that have already died a long time ago? Yes, it is exactly like that. Okay, so I just wanted to give like a, a, a little kind of overview of, of where this thing is going. I, I mentioned a little while ago that it was uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be just under a million miles away from the Earth. So um, the moon... Okay. Ah, um... Christina and Dari and several folks went to a, um, there's this really cool thing in Disney World that I've only now heard about and seen like videos on their stories. Uh, what was it called? Cafe 240? Is that, is that, do, do I have that name right? Um, basically it's, it's supposed to be like, you know, it's, it's, it's Disney World, so they're, they're replicating. It's supposed to be like a, um, a cafe in low earth orbit. I think it was it was called something like Cafe 240 or something like that, right? And so the premise was uh, a scientifically accurate one that you take a space elevator to this restaurant, not the restaurant at the end of the universe, but a restaurant that it's in low Earth orbit. And so that thing is is uh, at Epcot. Thank you, Dari. That thing is supposed to be 240 miles above the surface of the Earth, right? Space 220, Christina is saying. Okay. Space 220. That sounds about right. So the Hubble, sometimes it's a little closer, sometimes it's a little further. Um, the Hubble is about 350 miles 
above the surface of the Earth. Um, the International Space Station is, you know, is, is kind of in that area. The, the International Space, the ISS, is usually right around 240, 244, give or take. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be more like... 920,000 miles. So you can hear that it is substantially farther away than the Hubble or the International Space Station. Substantially farther away. Um, it's not going to be nearly as far as the sun. The sun is more like 93 million miles away. Um, this thing is going to be less than 1 million miles away. Uh, an interesting factoid, I, I heard an um, um, aerospace engineer uh, point out, so this thing's going to have a sun shield. Uh, the sun shield is basically going to shield the detectors on the James Webb Space Telescope uh, from light coming from the sun. Um, it's going to be, as I said earlier, it's going to be basically in an alignment from uh, the sun, the earth, and then the telescope. So the earth is going to be kind of like a big sun shield on its own. Uh, but the James Webb is also going to have further extra shields that will shield its detectors from other reflected light, say from um, light that was reflected off of the Earth, light that was reflected off of the moon. And um, this uh, aerospace engineer put this in terms of uh, sun protection factor, which is kind of funny because if you put sunscreen on, it's got like an SPF of 35, for example. SPF 50, that's very good expensive stuff. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to have a sun shield with an SPF of 10 million. I thought that was funny. Aaron, I'm, 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 why you don't believe that man has walked on the moon? Don't really buy into human space travel narrative? I'm not sure... Uh, how to respond to that, except that we can experimentally verify now just by bouncing lasers off of the surface of the moon that the Apollo astronauts literally put mirrors there. We can bounce lasers off of those mirrors by pointing lasers at those specific coordinates and we get reflections. We also have a lot of moon rocks collected uh, in person. And... Um, yeah, funny thing about the moon rocks. Um, I, I think it was... I read a, a, a percentage of this not too long ago. Over 80% of the moon rocks ever collected are still kept in absolutely pristine, completely sterile conditions. Uh, these are... When you think about, like, pound for pound, how much a moon rock must be worth... It's not worth so much because of the actual... It's not worth a lot for the same reasons that diamonds and gold are worth. Uh, it's worth a lot because of what it took to get those samples here and what it continues to take to keep those samples um, pristine and uh, uncontaminated by earth germs, for example. It's... Um, yeah... That they they expensive, and uh, uh, NASA and where those uh, the the powers that be that uh, have those in private collection guard them fastidiously to say the least. Ask Hunter anything. Email address ask Hunter anything at gmail dot com. Here's a funny little fact. I'm. If ever I'm feeling any kind of down or like, oh, poor me, for whatever reason, we all do that from time to time, obviously, right? I was talking to an anthropologist 
a couple of years ago who dropped a little fact that just just stunned me. She said only one in three people on the face of the earth have access to a flushing toilet. I mean, that should be mind-blowing. If you just, just take a moment to, to parse all the, the places in Africa, all the places in, like, rural China. Hell, maybe a lot of places in mainland China. Um, it just all the places all over the world, really. This is, this is distributed amongst a global population, this little fact. Only one in three people have access to a flushing toilet. And I guess what's, what's mind-blowing is that I have my own toilet. Right? <laughs> from, <laughs> I mean, from, from like a global scale of like how good or bad do you have it, uh, how much better would you like it? Do you, do you have a toilet? Because <laughs> if the answer is yes, you're doing better than most people. Yeah, it puts a lot of things in perspective. I mean, not only just from the, the obvious comfort level and that which is included in the privacy of having access to a flushing toilet, but just from a perspective of hygiene and life expectancy. Um, this is one of the things that I understand uh, Bill Gates is actively involved in, um, in Africa, is bringing more flushing toilet systems to far-reaching third world countries sort of conditions. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in just trying to make the world a better place and prevent the spread of disease and raise the quality of life, raise the life expectancy uh, amongst as many human beings as they can positively impact. Like one of the things that they're doing is coming up with flushable toilet systems. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. You can view more of my work at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions. In memory of Wolfgang Beastly. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.